All right, in this second video on integrated rate laws, we'll look at how to deal with reactions where there's more than one reactant. Um, when we introduced integrated rate laws in our earlier video, we were only looking at uh, reactions that were very simple decomposition reactions. There was one reactant, and it was decomposing. If you have only one reactant, then analyzing its rate law by uh, integrated rates, rates method is very simple. You just do your graphing of concentration of A versus time, natural log of concentration versus time, and your reciprocal of concentration versus time, and you're good to go. But most reactants are more complicated. They've got two or more reactants affecting the rate. So for example, here's a reaction with um, A moles of A and B moles of B making products. So the rate of this reaction depends on both A and B, potentially. So the rate law for that reaction, if you were, suppose you were to measure it in terms of the change of A over time, of course you could also measure B over time, but we'll measure A over time, then its rate law would look like K times A to the X and B to the Y. When you're doing an integrated rate law approach, you can only have one reactant changing concentration at a time. That way you can graph its concentration over time and then do your graphical analysis. But we have two reactants which potentially would be changing over time, and that, there's the problem. To deal with that, what we're going to do is an approach called flooding the system. Okay, you have a flask, you have a container, that's your system. We're going to flood the system using a much greater concentration of one of the two reactants than the other. If there were three reactants, then you would flood the system with two reactants so that only one reactant is really changing over time. If you've got a very high concentration, for example, of reactant B in this situation, then it would mean that B's concentration over time is essentially staying constant. Of course, it is dropping, but it's dropping very, very little um, compared to A. So if we have a very low concentration of A and a very high concentration of B, then we would be flooding the system with respect to B. All right? So its concentration would remain constant. If B's concentration is remaining constant, then we can perform graphical analysis on the concentration of A over time to determine its orders. So that's what we're going to jump in and do. So for example, in this case, the original rate law looked like K times A to the X and B to the Y. But if we have flooded the system with B, so that B is essentially constant, then we can say that K times b to the y is constant. If it's constant, then we can simply combine the original rate constant and the concentration of b to the power of y. We can combine those two constants into another constant, and we'll call it the pseudo rate constant, or k pseudo. Pseudo is just a Latin word that means false, a prefix that means false. So it's the false rate constant. But now notice that our rate law is simplified. We have only one reactant, which is in this differential rate law, changing its concentration over time. So now that we have only one reactant, we can jump in and do integration on this and study it through an integrated rates approach. But just remember that in this, in this new rate law, the k-pseudo is the product of the old rate constant and the concentration of b to the power of y. So keep that in mind. k pseudo is the rate constant times b to the power of y. So as an example, we're going to do a reaction where the concentration of A is very low, so in this case 0 0.0010 molar. The concentration of B is much greater, 0 0.5 molar. So we do have a much greater concentration of B than A. We have flooded the system with B. So now the B's concentration will remain essentially constant during the reaction, while A drops to a very low, even lower level than 0 0.001. Okay, so now that we're going to do this, we can measure the concentration of A over time. If we do that, suppose when we graph, we find this. So here's the um, concentration, I've got this title wrong, just ignore this. Um, this is me copying and pasting to save time. So we've got a, a graph of concentration of A over time. And we find this curve that's falling. 
as a falling curve like this, we know that that tells us that the concentration of A versus time is telling us that this is not a zero-order process. If it were linear, it would be zero-order. So we can see it's not zero-order. So now we um, go and make a second graph. We take our concentrations of A and we find the natural log of those concentrations and we make a new graph of, of natural log concentration versus time. And this time it sure looks linear, right? This data is not real data, it's fake data. That sure looks linear to me, which is leading me to conclude it's probably first order. However, just to be sure, we're going to make our third graph to test whether it was second order. And now we graph the reciprocal of concentration versus time. There's the reciprocal of A's concentration. And sure enough, that is not a linear curve. A linear graph is definitely curved. So what we can tell from that graph is that it's not second order. Okay, if it were linear, it would be second order. So going back, we looked at this natural log graph and we thought that sure looks linear to me. And so now we can say conclusively the reaction is first order for A. Okay, so we're looking at the concentration of A over time. So from this graph, we've determined the order for A. It's a first order process. But we want to we want to actually know the entire rate law. We don't want to just know the order for A. We also want to know the order for B. And we also would like to know the rate constant. One approach would be to repeat the experiment, but this time perhaps flooding the system with A so that A stays constant, and then graphing the um, concentration of B over time. That's a, that is one way to do it. Alternatively, we can play a little game. Okay, So we'll take a look at what we're going to do. From the graph of um, natural log versus time, we calculate its slope. We do linear regression and find the slope of this line. If there was only one reactant, then we would have said that the slope was equal to negative k. But in this case, with more than one reactant, this slope is now equal to negative k pseudo. Okay, so that's our pseudo rate constant, the slope of this line. So we perform linear regression. And we find, using the data from this experiment, that the pseudo rate constant is 0 0.347. In other words, the slope of that graph was negative 0 0.347, so k pseudo is positive 0 0.347. But k pseudo was equal to the actual rate constant times the concentration of b to the power of y. So 0 0.347 is going to equal k times point <coughs> excuse me, 0 0.05 to the power of y because we were using a concentration of B of 0.5 molar in this experiment. But now suppose we don't want to repeat the experiment by flooding the system with A and, and uh, using very little B. Suppose we want to actually repeat almost the same experiment we just did. But this time we'll use, um, we'll, we're, so we're going to again flood with B, but this time we're going to use double the concentration of B. So we're going to flood the system with B, but this time the B's concentration will be 1 molar instead of 0.5 molar. So now that we, we already know that the reaction was first order with respect to A, so we're just going to quickly do another graph of, of natural log concentration of A versus time. And from this, the new graph with a B concentration of 1 molar, we get a different slope. And that means we have a different K pseudo. So in this new experiment, using a, twice the concentration of B, we find that in this new experiment, the um, K pseudo from the slope is larger. It's 1.390. And that's equal to K times B to the Y. But again, B was 1 molar in this new experiment, so 1.390 is equal to K times 1 to the Y. Now, taking the two pseudo rate constants that we've got, we can divide them. Okay? We can do this little trick like similar to what we did with differential rate laws. We can divide the two, um, rate co the two uh, pseudo rate constants. And when you divide them, notice that your rate constant cancels out. And so you end up getting 1.39, the new rate, pseudo rate constant, divided by 0 0.347, the old pseudo rate constant, gives us 4.01.
the concentration of B in the two experiments were 1 and 0.5. So dividing those, we get 2 to the power of Y. Looking at that now, we can see that Y was equal to 2. But we also actually know the, we can, we can calculate the actual value of the rate constant in addition to the order for B. If you're observant, you'll notice back up here that if we used a B concentration of 1, then 1 to the power of 2 or 1 to the power of anything is just 1. So we can actually see what the value of K was going to equal. But having said that, let's, let's uh, look at this in a more general way. If you have the new rate law, the rate is equal to k times a to the 1, we found it was first order, b to the 2, we've determined it's second order. We're going to calculate the rate constant using the pseudo rate constant, k is equal to k pseudo divided by b squared, right? We, we know that the old pseudo rate constant, we said earlier, that k pseudo was equal to the actual rate constant times b to the y, but we now know that y is a 2. So rearranging that, we get k equals k pseudo divided by b squared. We can calculate k using either of our experiments. In fact, it would be good to do it for both experiments and take an average value of k. But we take 1.39 divided by 1 squared, or you could take 0.347 divided by 0.5 squared, and you would get the same value, or very close to the same value with this fake data. You get 1.390. Now the units for this rate constant, I deduce, you can deduce it from here, or you can deduce it from the original rate law. It was third order overall. Um, so if it's third order overall, then the units had to be m to the minus 2, and since we were using minutes in our graphing, minutes to the minus 1 are the units for the, for the new rate constant. For an overall third order reaction, those are the units for your rate constant. So there we've, got, we've done it. We've taken a reaction with more than one reactant. We flooded the system with respect to one of the reactants, so its concentration was held constant. We then used graphical analysis to find the order of the other reactant. Once we found the order of that reactant, we could also find the pseudo ray constant. We repeated the experiment with a different concentration of the flooded um, reactant. We now have two pseudo ray constants. From those two pseudo ray constants, we found a ratio of them to find the order for the reactant that we'd flooded and then we used its order and its concentration and the pseudo rate constant to calculate the actual rate constant of the reaction. So there's the approach to, to deal with reactions with more than one reactant in, a, in an integrated rate law analysis.